stuff the other day. Uh, we left off the other day on page 59, and we're going to try and get through a, a bunch today. Um, Nathaniel's being taught by his history tutor, and they're talking about the government, and the, you know, the history tutor says the government's noble and all that kind of stuff. And he says to Nathaniel, bottom of page 59, Honor is the most important quality for a magician. He or she has great power, must use it with discretion. In the past, and he goes on and talks about rogue uh, magicians, etc. Okay? And so Nathaniel asks him, Are you a magician? He says, No. Uh, I was not selected. Was Nathaniel selected? Ashland's shaking her head no. He was given up, right? He was sold. His parents sold him. It's, it's not a matter of being selected, right? Oh, so you're a commoner. Notice the distinction. Magician, male and female, versus, or, depending on how you look at it, commoner. Commoner, pretty much in any context, implies what? Lower, average, so-so. Not superior, not above, etc. So, we're told, shortly after that, Nathaniel's Lessons start to get harder. He turns eight years old. He starts studying other things. We're going to skip a bunch. Okay. And he also picks up a new teacher, an art teacher, Mrs. Lutians, or Luchens, as it, um, I think if I remember correctly, is how it's pronounced. Okay. And there's a reason why he has an art teacher. We find out he has to become an excellent draftsman. Why? He's got to be able to draw, without a compass, a perfect circle. Notice, that's not a perfect circle. He's got to be able to draw a perfect star. That's not a perfect star. I would fail as a magician. Okay? Um, so, he doesn't simply work on circles and stars and squares, however. He learns... What's called draftsmanship. He learns to draw figures. He learns to draw characters. <coughs> he learns to draw buildings. He learns landscape. You know, drawing, all that kind of stuff. Okay? So, his education goes on. Chapter 9. We're told, between the ages of 6 and 8, he meets with his master once a week, etc. In, in the opening paragraph, and I'm not going to talk about it, other than to say, the opening paragraph of that chapter kind of gives us an impression of his master. That is, it, it's Nathaniel's preparation for going down and, and what he thinks about him as he's going down. You know, and it's almost like this guy has this aura of majesty, of mystery about him. Okay? So, page 64 and 65. Now, remember what his history teacher told him about magicians. What's the primary characteristic of a magician? Honor is the most important quality. Okay? Page 59. Now look at the bottom of 64 and 65. His master, Arthur Underwood, says a magician is a wielder of power. A magician exerts his will and effects change. If you read that essay by Tolkien on fairy stories, Tolkien says, magic is the domination of wills and things. Okay? Domination, control. A magician exerts his will and effects change. He can do it from selfish motives 
or virtuous ones. The results of his actions can be good or evil. But the only bad magician is an incompetent one. Notice how he defines bad. Incompetence. So you can be a good magician simply how? By having the ability. By being competent when you are trying to call up a demon to do something for you. Notice, good or bad there has nothing to do with morality. So, you're a good magician if you force a demon, a genie, a folia, an afri, etc., a majid, to do your will. It doesn't matter what you're telling that entity to do. You might be telling that entity, oh, let's get all real current news. I don't know if you saw the news this morning. Horrific event in New Zealand. 49 Muslims killed at two different mosques by a single gun. Okay? So, your job as magician might be to call up a demon to make someone go do that. Morality speaking wise, hopefully most people would say that was an evil act. That was a bad act. But according to Arthur Underwood, that's a good magician. He got him to do what he wanted him to do. Okay? What is the definition of incompetence, boy? Loss of control. That is, if you don't control that demon, what's going to happen? The demon's going to control you. Okay? So, providing the magician remains in control of the forces he has set to work, he remains what? What does he remain? And notice, this is part of the training. Nathaniel's memorized these three S's. Safe, secret, strong, etc. Okay? So they go on. We find out, you know, he's, he's proud of the kid. The kid's learning well. The kid's got good skills and such. So, Bottom of 65. Demons are the great secret. Notice, we up here, magicians, we've got to keep what? The source of our power secret from these people down here. Common people know of their existence, know we can commune with them. That's why they fear so. But they don't realize the full truth, which is that all our power comes from them. Why don't the commoners know that full truth? Well, okay, keep going. Why don't the magicians let the commoners know that full secret? What would commoners do? They'd start learning how to control demons. President Obama taught, my opinion, extremely naively about trying to make a world in which there are no nuclear weapons. Why is that naive? <clears throat> Louder? It ain't gonna happen. Why? Using the language of the kind of story this comes out of, that genie is out of the bottle. How do you put the genie back in the bottle? If the genie doesn't want to go. Where is that knowledge available? You can look up online detailed instructions how to build a nuclear bomb. And you can get almost everything you need except for a couple of primary ingredients. Uranium and or plutonium. Unless you know where to the right people to talk to. Right? So, he says... Our single great, single great ability is to summon them, the demons, and bend them to our will. If we do it correctly, they have to obey us. That is, if we are competent, they have to obey us. If we make an error, we're dead. Okay? So, he keeps being taught. Page 66. They're in, their, in his study, and he says, this bookcase right here, imagine there's a bookcase. 
everything. This is your reading material for the next three years. Everything from there to there. Behind Arthur Underwood, in another bookcase, it's another bunch of books. Okay. Nathaniel turns. <clears throat> Behind the door, there's another bookcase. And he says, work your way through that lot, and you might be getting somewhere. That case contains the rites and incantations you need to summon significant demons. Okay. You won't even begin to use these until you're in your teens. And what does Nathaniel do? He masters the one for the next three years in less than a year. That is, he reads them, and some of the material he memorizes. He's got it down pat. So, unbeknownst to his master, before that three years is up, He's already working in this bookcase. And he's not supposed to be able to start, we're told, until he's in his teens. That's at least 13. He starts that when he's nine. Right? So, uh, let's skip a bunch. I can skip all that. Little, you know, indication of his character, page 71. Nathaniel is still being taught and stuff, and we're told, impatient for progress, he devoured the books in the library case. Impatient. He really, he wants to learn everything he can. And notice, his art teacher, the very next thing, patience. Patience is the prime virtue. If you hurry, you will fail. Well, what's he do? He hurries. Does he fail? We'll talk about that. Let's go on a bit. Um, so, Bartimaeus returns from the mission he was sent on at the beginning of the book. What was the mission? Retrieve the amulet of Samarkand. So now he returns. Finally, it's been 70 pages from the opening of the book. And Nathaniel finds out he was pursued. That is, Bartimaeus was pursued. He's not happy. Okay. And he looks at the amulet. He gives it back to Bartimaeus. And he tells him, bottom of 82, top of 83, take this. And hide it in the magical repository of the magician Arthur Underwood. Conceal it so that he can't find it. Okay. And then come back. He thought, okay, so where does this guy live? Downstairs. Hmm. Next chapter, opening page, page 84. Framing your master, are you? Nasty. He thinks. He's trying to get Underwood in trouble. I'm not framing him. I just want it safe behind whatever security he's got. No one's going to find it there. But if they do, and notice Bartimaeus finishes the sentence, you'll be in the clear. Typical magician's trick. You're learning faster than most. Learning what faster? Trickery. What else? Deceit? Who's Nathaniel looking out for? <coughs> himself. himself. He's all about himself. Okay? So, Bartimaeus tells us, bottom of that page, framing another magician, that wasn't usual, that's part and parcel, came with the territory. Framing your own master, though, well, now that's kind of out of the ordinary. I mean, that's unique in a wizarding, a uh, wizardling of 12. What's he mean? Ooh, this kid's going places. He's, I mean, he's already doing the kind of stabbing in the back stuff that 20-year-olds do, and he's only 12. Yeah, I'm adult, adult magicians, you know, they do that with regularity, but not when they're starting off, not when they're just being taught the rules. 
And then he tells us in a long footnote, 85, magicians are the most conniving, jealous, duplicitous group of people on earth, even including lawyers and academics. Notice that even including means what? Lawyers and academics are the epitome of conniving, jealous, duplicity. Saying one thing, but intending something else. All right? So, he tells us, middle of that page 85, it seemed that to guard his own skin, this ungrateful child was risking bringing the wrath of a powerful, powerful magician down upon its innocent master's head. I, I was oppressed. Okay, keep in mind, Bartimaeus is what? According to magicians, what word do they use to call him? A demon. So, when he says, I was oppressed, he's kind of living up to that nomenclature, if you want. Okay? But he thinks there's somebody else pulling his strings. Even though he had to be in cahoots with an adult, some enemy of his master, he doesn't think Nathaniel's doing this on his own. Okay? So, let's see here. Bartimaeus does what he's told to do. He puts the amulet in the magical bookcase, essentially. And on his way back up, what does he overhear? Martha Underwood talking to her husband, and she refers to the boy by his birth name, Nathaniel. Page 94. I had a chance at him now. Things were a bit more even. He knew my name. I knew his. He doesn't know that he knows his birth name. He just knows that he knows a name. He had six years experience. I had 5,010. He's saying, let's look at the odds of who's going to win here. Six years experience. 5,000 years. I've got him. All right? So, he gets up to his pentacle, page 95, and he says, uh, excuse me, he, um, chapter 12, we're back with Nathaniel and Mrs. Lutens. She's telling him again, patience. You're too restless. It's your biggest fault. If it's his biggest fault, then what is it going to do? That's going to get you in trouble. Okay? Why is she counseling patience? Well, most of pages 96 and 97 are why she's counseling patience. What's he telling her? He doesn't realize what I can do. I've read all of his books. And she's like, all of them? Well, all the ones in his little bookcase. He said they'd keep me going till I was 12. Excuse me, I said, you know, he started reading the other ones when he was 9. I'm not even 11 yet. So he finished all those when he was 10. And he's already started the others. Okay? So they talk more. He finds out about the politics of, you know, his period. He talks about, they find out about the two great, you know, prime minister. Prime Ministers, Gladstone and Disraeli, both real British Prime Ministers, by the way. So notice what Stroud is do, doing. He's using the real world and overlaying this kind of magical world on top of it. Okay? Um, let's see here. They keep talking Underwood page 101 introduces him to several other magicians who stop by in it's this instance what happens here that sets in motion the beginning of the novel okay so they start asking him some questions and he's there to do what for, is he showing off for himself? No. Because how he does reflects on his master. Okay. Right? 
In one of the young men, page 102, one of the men tells Nathaniel, you've got a tongue in your head, not afraid of your elders. He doesn't say anything, notice. Perhaps you don't think we're your betters, too. Bottom of 102, he's still silent. Perhaps he thinks he's too good to talk to us at all now. So, his master says, go. And the young man says, no, no, let's see, let's see what you've taught him. And so he starts the fire rapid question. And, it's, and Nathaniel, boom, 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 answers everyone perfectly. Okay. Page 104. The young man says, after Nathaniel replies to some questions, okay, about language and, you know, responding in words of direction in any language, Nathaniel replies in Latin, pari mane asculta sedere pari ready. And then he gives the English translation. The young man says, what? Standards must have dropped. I mean, if you can do that, pretty much anybody can. And what does Nathaniel do? He steps out of line. You're just a sore loser. Okay. How old is he at this point? Ten. He smarts off to a guy in his 20s. Nathaniel feels... Something small and compact land heavily on his shoulders. Invisible hands clenched into his hair, jerked it backward with vicious strength so that his face stares up at the ceiling. The man comes up close to him and says to him, You cocksure gutter snipe, what will you do now? Can you get free? No, how surprising. You're helpless. You know a few words, but you're capable of nothing. Perhaps this will teach you the dangers of insolence when you're too weak to fight back. Notice, it's okay to be insolent, is what he's just said. It's okay to smart off to your superiors, but only when. You back it up. When you're strong enough to back it up. When you can fight for yourself. Okay? Nathaniel looks at his master for support. And what does his master do? Turns away. Whatever happened to loyalty? Well, loyalty is a one-way street in the Underwood house. So, Nathaniel leaves. Okay. As he leaves, he asks Mrs. Underwood, who, who are those people? And she tells him, oh, that's Simon Lovelace. Did you meet him? Yes, I did. You okay? No, I'm, I'm okay. I'll go up now. So he goes up stairs. He, he, he has ringing in his ears. You're too weak to fight back. You're incapable of anything. And what does he do? He speaks three words of command. He utters the name Simon Lovelace. He follows it with a final word. He smashes a box. And suddenly, page 108 in the middle, the magicians barely had time to look up before the mites were upon them. So these little sprite-like spirits, but they're called mites. <laughs> so they're like biting, stinging bugs are all over the other three magicians. Okay? And Nathaniel's there. He tries to leave. And what happens? Uh, excuse me. He's in a schoolroom when this happens. And what happens? Simon Lovelace comes in. And we're told, middle of 109, Nathaniel was ripped bodily from Mrs. Luchin's grasp, carried through the air. For a moment, he hung suspended midway between ceiling and floor. And then he hears Mrs. Luchin shouting something, and he hangs there, and an invisible hand or an invisible stick struck him on his rump. He yells, he kicks, and again, and again. For how long? Long before the tireless hand had ceased its work, Nathaniel stopped kicking. He hung limply, aware only of the stinging's pain in the ignominy of his punishment. 
The fact that Mrs. Lutyens was witness to it made it far more brutal. Fervently he wished he were dead, and when at last the darkness swelled up and began to carry him away, he welcomed it with all his heart. The hands released him, but he was already unconscious before he hit the floor. What do we just witness to? Is this discipline? Is it punishment? Is this a mere spanking? No. This is torture. How do you know it's torture? He's beaten unconscious. Okay? Unconscious. The pain is so overwhelming, he blacks out. And then he's dropped to the floor. He's confined to his room for a month. And we're told, bottom of 110, such solitude, that is, being left to himself, had driven him, such solitude might have driven him mad had he not discovered a discarded <coughs> ballpoint pen under his bed. With this and a few sheets of paper, he managed to waste some of the time with a series of sketches of the world beyond the window. When these became tedious, he devoted himself to compiling a large number of of minutely detailed lists and notes drawn over his sketches. These contained the beginnings of his revenge. So what's he noting? I'm going to get that SOB, Simon Douglas. <laughs> and he will pay. So his month detention is finished. And what does he discover? Really the only person, other than Martha Underwood, the only person that he has any affection for in this entire home, and it's a big house, has been canned. Why? What did she do while he was being beaten into submission? She screamed. Prob We're not told what she screamed, but I think the implication is she is screaming, stop, stop this, but what is she? She's a commoner. How dare she intervene in a matter between magicians? Okay? So, page 13. He makes swift progress in his studies. Why? What fuels him? A desire for a degree? No. Hate. Hate's a pretty good motivator. Hate can make you do an awful lot of things. Hate can make you endure an awful lot of pain. Well, that's what's happening, okay? So, page 113, bottom of the page. Arthur Underwood had forfeited his right to Nathaniel's obedience and respect the moment he failed to shield him from Simon Loveless's jibes and physical assaults. That is, he should have stopped Loveless when Loveless called him a cocksure gutter snipe. He should have said, hey, come on now, this is my apprentice. You don't talk like that to him. But he doesn't. Nor does he stop the beating. So, as far as Nathaniel's concerned, you're just an enemy too. Okay? So, bottom of 115. He's thinking, and what are we told? To be safe and strong, you had to be secret. Notice, we're not talking here about the knowledge magicians have. We're talking about Nathaniel's now inner state. What's he have to be secret about? The revenge he's plotting. The true magician kept his own counsel. Doesn't talk to anybody else. Okay? Go on a bit more. Going to skip a bunch. Um, so, Bartimaeus tells Nathaniel about what this large guy with the scar in his face, you know, told Loveless about the amulet, etc. So I'm going to keep skipping some. We go up to bottom of 121, top of 122. Nathaniel is progressing, and he finally chooses the demon he is going to summon to help get his revenge. And he chose, we're told, bottom of 122, 
Bartimaeus. Okay. Skip a bit. Um, now we're told, 124, perceptive readers might have noticed a new optimism in my attitude toward the kid. They would not be wrong. Why? Because I knew his birth name. So between when he first hears the name Nathaniel and now, he now knows this isn't his made-up name. This is his real name. And we have the footnote. Armed with this, I would be able to combat the whippersnapper's most vicious attacks. Knowledge of the name redresses the power balance a little, you see, acting as a kind of defensive shield. Okay. So... Nathaniel says some things, and notice, Bartimaeus just kind of blows him off. Doesn't listen to him, even though he is still under a spell, under a command. So, page 127. He's, he's kind of egging um, Nathaniel on. 128. Bartimaeus says to Nathaniel, why not ask the boss? He'll help you out. That is, why are you having me do this? Why don't you ask your master? My master? No, not that old fool. That is, not Underwood. The real person, the one who's directing you against Loveless. There is no one. I don't have a boss. Well, that just kind of shuts up part of me. Yes. I'm acting on my own. Wait, <laughs> you summoned me by yourself? And then Bartimaeus tells us, I was talking too much, I knew, but I couldn't help it. I was worried. <coughs> The kid was looking at me with a calculating expression that I didn't like. The reason he's worried? This kid's power. That's what he's worried about. This kid can do things that he shouldn't be able to do. Okay? So he goes on and says, it's Loveless I'm interested in. Bartimaeus kind of rattles his cage some more. And so Nathaniel says, well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to send you on a mission. Okay? And once you leave, what's the mission? Beginning of the book. That's to go off and get the amulet of Samarkin from Simon Loveless. What's the... Um, and he says, after I send you off on that commission, I'm going to do something. Okay? He says, I'm going to make you suffer. And he starts looking around through his room, and he finds an old battered tin. Bartimaeus says, that's a tobacco tin. I mean, smoking kills. He says, no, it's not tobacco anymore. It's full of rosemary. And we're told, rosemary is like death to demons. I'm going to send you on a mission now, and the moment you've gone, I shall cast the spell of indefinite confinement, binding you into this tin. And I'll make it start a month from today. If for any reason I'm not around a month from today to cancel this spell, you're going to find yourself drawn into this tin and trapped there until such time as it is opened again. So is he just going to leave the tin on the windowsill in a bookcase? No. He says, and, just to make it worse, I'm going to tie the tin to a brick. I shall bind this tin with bricks and throw it into the Thames. That is, I'm going to go across one of the bridges. I think it's Blackfriars that he goes across. He's going to get to the middle of Blackfriars Bridge and drop it. Well, the Thames, if I remember correctly, high tide. Thames is about 50, 60 feet deep there. High tide. Low tide, it's about 30, 40 feet deep. When is this tin going to be found? Probably not ever. So for an awful long time, Bartimaeus is going to be confined in this tin of rosemary. And rosemary eats at a demon's essence. So... You better do what I ask you to do. Hate is a powerful motivator for Nathaniel. 
Fear of having his essence eaten away for all eternity. That's a powerful motivator for Bartimaeus. Okay? And we get to part two. So, Nathaniel's thinking, he's like, oh man, I'm screwed. Bartimaeus knows my name. Okay? So, it's time for Nathaniel's naming. Why? He's reached kind of, not literally the end of his apprenticeship, but he's reached the end of, let's say, the first stage of his apprenticeship. And he's going to have to choose a name. He doesn't just choose a name out of thin air. When they go down to the government, we find that there are books, whole books of names that he can choose from, okay? An almanac. In page 141, <coughs> Nathaniel's talking with his master, and he just kind of, well, haphazardly off the cuff says, well, could I choose William Gladstone? Could that be my name? And his master's like, what the hell? The very idea, 141, there are some names, boy, that are too great, too recent to touch. No one would dare. I mean, ambition, that's it's good. It shows you ambition. You have ambition. But you got to cloak it. Why? What happens if you look too ambitious? What will people think? Okay, let me put it this way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring politics in for a moment. I don't care your politics. It doesn't matter what mine are. Um, a couple people have talked about throwing their name in the Democratic ring to run for president in 2020. Okay? One of them actually has. He did yesterday. He started driving around Iowa. Anybody know who I'm thinking of? He recently ran for Senate in Texas. And lost. Beto O'Rourke. Beto O'Rourke. His real name is Rocker. Okay? He's Irish. <laughs> He's married to a billionaire. His family's a billionaire. Okay? Anyways. He served in Congress for three terms. Six years. All right? Now he's running for president. After three terms in Congress. Okay? A person who ran for governor of Georgia, Stacey Abrams, has said, suggested, she might run for, gov uh, for president, not governor, for president, right? She wasn't elected governor of Georgia. She lost that race. What does that say about both of them? There's a lot of ambition there, right? Because usually when you... When you run for a major office, that means you have some kind of, you know, multiple elective history behind you. And usually, I'm not, you know, trying to be negative here. And not just as a representative. Because as a representative, how many people have voted for you? Not a lot. Not a lot. Okay. 435 representatives in the House of in the House of Representatives. There's 435 representative districts in the United States. Okay? Plus Senate. Beto couldn't even get Texas to essentially vote for him. How does he think he's gonna get all the other states? Stacey Abrams couldn't even get Georgia. It's not even half the size of Texas to elect her. How does she think she's going to get more? The point is, he says, come on, <laughs> that's overly ambitious. It's good. Ambition's good, but you have to hide it. You got to put it, you know, under a cloak for a while, okay? So he says, no, you can't choose that name. So they go through and they pull a name out finally, okay? Go on to, uh, am I going to talk? No, I guess not. Um... Let's see here. So, um, 
when I said earlier that um, Nathaniel sends him to go get the amulet and he does the 10, I, was mis uh, I misspoke. That's not the amulet. He's sending him to Sholto Pins to get some information. Okay? So, Bartimaeus goes off to Sholto Pins, the Pins accoutrements. That's where you can buy magical stuff if you're a magician. Okay? And he asks a bunch of questions of an imp who works there. I'm going to skip a bunch. What's the important thing that happens there? He gets caught. He blows up Penn's store, which is kind of a blow to the magicians because everybody buys stuff here. Okay? This would be like blowing up the swankiest place in Beverly Hills that all the Hollywood stars and celebrities and you know music industry celebrities, etc., buy at. So he gets caught. Um, but he doesn't say anything. Why? Because he's under, you know, command not to. Um, let's see. Keep going. Pages 176, 177. So Nathaniel's still going on through his teaching. And his master tells him, we're going to go to an event with the government. It's a party, essentially. All the in people, all the important people are invited. Guess who's invited? Arthur Underwood. How important is Arthur Underwood, really? Chubbins got a look on his face. Like, he, he's what in the government? Is he a cabinet-level minister? No. He's a junior minister. How old is Arthur Underwood? He's in his 50s or 60s. Should he, if he had ambition, should he still be a junior level? He does not have the ambition of Beto O'Rourke or Beto O'Rourke or Stacey Abrams. Because if he did, he'd be a whole lot higher. Or maybe he has the ambition, but he lacks what? Competence. Maybe he's just not that good of a magician. Okay? So, they're going to go to this big, fancy party. And, page 177, Underwood comes looking for him, because it's time to get ready to go. And he finds him. And Nathaniel says, sorry, sir, I was reading, and he's got a book in front of him. He says, not that book you weren't. It's fourth level, written in Coptic. What's Coptic? Christian Egyptian. Okay? You'd never have a hope. You were asleep. Don't deny it. And what does the narrator tell us? His eyes were closed. But why is that important? It's when Nathaniel reads and then he closes his eyes. That's when he commits to memory what he's just read. Okay? So, they get in the car. They drive off. Page 179, they see um, they see the night police and such. And I want to pick up on 182. Actually, yeah. 182. Top of the page. Nathaniel began to notice groups of silent onlookers standing on the sidewalks, watching the cars go by. As best he could judge, their mood seemed sullen, even hostile. Most of the faces were thin and drawn. Okay, so what does it usually mean if someone's face is thin and drawn? We don't usually. We don't usually see this in the United States. Why? Because even most people that are poor, Unless they are literally homeless, they, they aren't hungry. The homeless are often hungry. Okay? But if you go to another country, you will see a lot of people who are thin and drawn. They're hungry. They're malnourished. 
they don't have enough food to eat. Who are these people? They're the commoners. Why? Because the magicians get all the good stuff. Everybody else, they kind of have to scrape by. Large men in gray uniforms stood casually further off, keeping an eye on the crowds. Everyone, policemen and commoners alike, look very cold. So what are the policemen doing? Notice they're standing kind of a ways off from the commoners. Why? Why aren't they right in there among them? They're calm right now. They're calm right now. What's the police presence for? To keep them that way. To make sure the commoners stay calm. Okay? Are we led to believe that there are as many police as there are commoners? No. No. And there never are in a police state. Go to North Korea, go to Cuba, go to, Russia doesn't work anymore, go to China. Well, China, there's not even China. China's got a two million man army. How many people are there in China? A billion. A billion. But they've only got two million in the army. You do the math. Okay. So how do... A million, or two million, keep a billion down. It's the threat of force. All right? This is a police state of sorts. It's a tyranny. What kind of tyranny is it? It's not a tyranny of a single dictator, the prime minister, so to speak. It's the tyranny of this class over this class. This is not, you know... As some people might say today, the capitalist versus the 99%. It's not that. Okay? This is political class, not economic class. Okay? So, notice, he's in the car. The commoners are cold. The cops doing their job, he's in a nice warm car. They drive on by. He was important. Nathaniel's thinking about himself. I'm important. I'm set apart from the rest. And it felt good. For the first time in his life, he knew the lazy exhilaration of easy power. Why? I will never be like these. He will never be thin and drawn. He will never be hungry. He will never be cold. He's thinking. And yet... We get through another third of the novel, and he's going to be exactly those things, okay? So, they go into the party, and what happens? Nathaniel thinks he's going for what purpose? He's going to meet people. He's going to be introduced. This is my apprentice. And what does Mr. Underwood do? He walks off and ignores him. What does Mrs. Underwood do? Why is she excited to be there? Ooh, look at so-and-so's pretty dress. Ooh, look at so-and-so's pretty. She's just there because she reads People magazine, essentially, to look at the pretty people. Okay? So, we see Nathaniel get introduced again to a couple other people. And we see the explosion happen, and Nathaniel sees who causes it, okay, page 200 and 201, and because he sees who did it, and he has a little bit of information, what happens? His profile rises a little bit, okay? So, on the way back, page 203 and following. He's talking with Mr. Underwood, and Mr. Underwood explains kind of what happened, because Nathaniel's been in the dark. So you got magicians and commoners. Who else among commoners 
are there who want to bring it into this? Yeah, I never thought about this before, but there is a, a modern kind of political corollary. Not magicians and such. Who's the head of the government? Trump, right? Everybody else. And <coughs> in part of the everybody else, there is a group that does call themselves the exact same term this group calls itself here. The resistance. Antifa and such are part of the resistance. The, depending upon your politics, the left wing or far left wing, whatever, of the Democratic Party are, you know, the resistance to Trump, not to the magician. So who's the resistance? There are people who want to overthrow this system of government. Why? Inequality. It's not fair. It's not right. Okay? So how are they doing that? Are they marching? Are they protesting? No, they're doing what? They're lobbing bombs. They're breaking in and stealing things. Okay? A bunch of traitors, 203, who don't like us being in control. As if we hadn't given this country all its wealth and greatness. No one knows who they are, but they certainly aren't numerous. Handful of commoners drumming up support in meeting houses, a few half-wit firebrands who resent magic and what it does for them. What it does for them. What does magic do for commoners? Well, according to his history teacher, it protects them. Though... When there are wars, who fights in the wars? Primarily commoners. There are some magicians who go out and do magical kind of stuff, but they're commoners. Okay? They hate us and everything magical. They want to bring the government down. So they keep talking. Why do they steal magical objects? He says, to reduce our power. Their thinking's all wrong-headed. Perhaps they hope it'll reduce our power. Some devices can be used by non-magicians, etc., etc. He goes, it doesn't matter why they want to do it. Okay? So, government will have to act now. And we'll pick up with somewhere around chapter 21 on Monday. We'll finish on Wednesday. We'll have a quiz either Monday or Wednesday. I haven't decided yet.